everyone, this video is in response to totally Lexi's uh, questions on uh, can I do a video exploring the diversity of matter by chemical composition and chapter four, which is exploring diversity of matter using separation techniques. Of course I can. So here is the response video for that question. So I'm going to assume that your chapter three is actually elements, compounds, and mixture. So I'm going to talk about uh, exactly what you need to know and what I will focus on if I have an exam, let's say next week or even tomorrow. Now, the first thing you need to know is the, uh, the definitions. So I'm going to just highlight them, okay? So you see the first one. What is an element? It is a substance which cannot be broken down into two or more simple substances by chemical means. And of course, you need to know the different examples of elements. Okay, and you need to know that uh, elements are arranged in what we call the periodic table. Okay, what is the meaning of a group? A group basically means vertical column of elements and period are horizontal. And you need to know that there's a, there's a line over here that separates the metal from the non-metals, metals being on the left-hand side and non-metals on the right-hand side. Okay, so that will be the first definition that you need to know, definition of elements. Next, uh, the properties of metals and non-metals, as you can see over here. Um, if I'm not wrong, for the chemical symbol, I don't think you need to memorize every single one of them because uh, at the end of the day, the, the the, uh, the periodic table will be given to you, so you can just refer to that. Users, yeah, yeah, I think you need to know the users of the different elements. Okay, next, of course, is the definition of a compound. Now, this is a definition that I always like to ask my students. You can ask them, ask them all the time. So, what is the definition of a compound? It's a substance made of two or more different elements, uh, chemically combined, okay, or they cannot be separated by physical method. So you need to know what are the examples of compound. Uh, here are some examples of the chloride, which is made of sodium and chlorine, uh, sugar, water, calcium carbonate, and sand, silicon. So how do you form compounds? You can either burn them, react with uh, one compound reacting with another compound, or uh, compound with other compounds or decomposition. And this is a very important table that if I were you, I would definitely memorize it. So something else very important with regards to compounds and mixtures uh, is right here in this table. So I'm going to explain one by one because I feel that is how important it is. Uh, first of all, no chemical reaction takes place in a mixture. Okay. The constituents can be mixed in any proportion. So for example, C, carbon dioxide, which is a compound, must be one carbon and two oxygen. Whereas a mixture, so for example, seawater, it can be any amount of H2O and salt and all sorts of stuff inside. Okay, that's what they mean by the constituents can be mixed in any proportion. Uh, next, the components can be easily separated by physical method. So for a mixture, for example, seawater, you can either filter it or you can do evaporation. And the water will be gone. Then after that, you'll be left with the residue. The okay, last one, the components retain their individual properties even when they are mixed together. So for example, uh, seawater again, when you take seawater and salt, you mix them together, you will still be able to taste or uh, you know experience the characteristics of the components which is water and salt whereas a compound is different so for example you take hydrogen and oxygen you mix them together you get a completely new thing which is liquid whereas uh, by itself hydrogen and oxygen is just a gas so in a nutshell that's what i think you need to know uh definitions and the differences between the compounds and mixture that i think is very very important Okay, so for the second question, you are talking about uh, separation technique. So I would like to refer you to this picture uh, table over here, which shows the different separation techniques. So the first thing about separation techniques is that you must know what exactly they are and what is separate. Okay, so here summarizes everything. So first we have chromatography. So what it does is it separates compounds in a solution with the same property. So most of the time it's being used to separate dyes or colors. 
Next, filtration. Solid or group of solids and liquids in a mixture. Basically, uh, in filtration, you have something that is insoluble and then something that is soluble. Okay, next, evaporation. Uh, solids that cannot decompose when heated in a uh, solution. So you would use evaporation where the water will be gone and it will be left with the residue. Next, crystallization, dissolve solids in a solution. So things like copper sulfate, you want the crystal, but you do not want the liquid. Okay, you will carry out crystallization. Simple distillations, uh, liquids in a solution, usually we call them miscible liquids. Example, alcohol, uh, ethanol or alcohol and water. And both of them must have different boiling point. Uh, fractional distillation will be a more complicated form of simple distillation. Uh, I don't think you'll be tested at the set one, set two level. Okay, usually set three, then you will see that. Next, separating funnel. Uh, Immiscible liquid, basically the two liquids cannot, cannot mix. Okay, so there will be a very distinct um, two layers. Okay, so you can basically you know, open the tap and slowly let one of the layer come out and then you get another one which is left behind. Okay, next sublimation. Substances that sublime from two substances. Example, some uh, solid iodine, okay, or ammonium salts. And lastly, magnetic attraction. So magnetic substances from non-magnetic ones like iron and sand, you want to think of the iron, stuff like that. So these are the different separation methods. So I think most important is that for each of the methods, there are some important things that you know. I'm going to zoom in some of them. Okay, let's take a look at chromatography. Now, what you're looking at is a diagram and it's a question that we have with regards to chromatography being used to identify a different colors, a food coloring in drinks. So the first thing you realize that we have a starting line over here and then we have different spots. Now, these different spots are the results of the chromatography um, technique. Okay, so you need to know that if you were to draw a line and then this line, let's say this line corresponds to this, uh, you know, this spot here corresponds to this spot here. That means they are actually the same color. And you also need to know that, uh, for example, this brown color in green E is actually made up of four different colors. One, two, three, four, as shown over here. Okay, so from here, you can see that this, this one is pure. There's like four of them, two, one, three, and two. So perhaps we can take a look at the question and see what is required. So you see the first one, which colors are single dye? So this is a single dye because it's only made of one color and this is also a single dye. Next, how many dyes are contained in the orange color of drink B? So for drink B, you can see that there are three different colors as seen in the diagram. Next. How the brown color used in drink E can be produced. So you see this uh, drink E, one, two, three, four. Uh, you, what you do is we look at the corresponding colors. Okay, you can see that. Uh, okay, so you see that the four dots over here can be created by mixing drink D as well as drink A. So if you take drink D, you mix with drink A, you actually get drink E. Okay, next. So the yellow color used in drink F is a natural dye. All the other colors are artificial dye. Some countries only allow natural dyes and for such a reason. Well, uh, I think it's pretty obvious. If it's natural, that means it could be, it will, it should be edible. Okay, we do not want toxic or poisonous stuff in the food. So two reasons why chromatography is suitable for identifying the dyes used in the food. Uh, so usually for chromatography, you only need a small amount of sample. You don't need a lot, you know, to, to carry out the experiment. Okay, reason number two could be, um, you know, the results can be seen very quickly. And uh, reason number three, I mean, if they need more reason, is that uh, the results are very clear. You can see clearly what are the dyes that are used. So here's another typical type of question which they like to ask. For example, we have six different separation techniques and they want you to select what would be the best. So for example, petrol from crude oil uh, is fractional distillation. Iodine from copper to oxide. 
A would be sublimation. Red dye from black ink, we use chromatography. Cooking oil from water, they are immiscible, the oil will float. Uh, so you can actually use a separating function. Sorry. Uh, so back to here. Okay, alcohol from an aqueous solution, which is, we will use distillation because they can mix. So cooking oil from water, we will use a separating funnel because they're invisible. Uh, next, sand from mixture of sand and seawater, we use filtration because the sand cannot dissolve. And lastly, ammonium chloride from sodium chloride. Uh, because ammonium salts are that they can supply, so we use sublimation. So here's another typical question that they like to ask with regards to distillation. Now when it comes to distillation, basically you have two miscible liquid over here, uh, but they have different boiling points. So the first thing to take note is that your thermometer, the bulb, right, has to be here at the opening of the condenser. Next thing you need to know is that water goes in from the bottom and comes out from the top. So these are the things that you need to take note of. So let's try this question. Uh, first name, the separation technique used, this is the simple distillation. State whether the water enters at X or Y, enters at, enters at Y, okay? How would you know that pure water passing will flask into the condenser? Now, because we want pure water, it's over here is seawater. Uh, the outcome is that we would like water, pure water, H2O, to be here, and then, you know, whatever residue to be on this side. So you need to make sure, and how we make sure that the order is there, we look at the thermometer, make sure that the temperature is not higher than 100 degrees Celsius, because they're exactly 100 degrees Celsius, or maybe slightly higher, because there are a lot of, uh, you know, stuff, so mixture inside here. Uh, we want to make sure that the temperature doesn't exceed 100 degrees Celsius, and therefore, we get pure water here. When the process is completed, name two possible substances left. So here is water. Uh, wait, they asked about the flask, right? So left in the flask, uh, you have salt, you have sand. Okay. Salt and sand will be left. Okay, so that is all for this video. I hope it answers your questions. If you have any other queries, feel free to ask me. Thank you very much.